What's up, everybody? Today, I'm going to walk you guys through some of the cool gear stuff we've been using in the Dungeons & Dragons games. I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of it, and if you have uh, never played D&D before, it can look like a lot of stuff. It can be a little intimidating, if, especially if you want to start playing the game yourself. I've been actually playing Dungeons & Dragons for about 10 years now. It's quite a lot of time. So even though there's a lot of stuff on the table, it's not like I got it all at once. It's kind of one of those games you keep playing and you slowly keep accumulating small things uh, from time to time. So eventually, after you've been playing it for a while, you have a ton of stuff to decorate your board and bring your worlds to life. If you're trying to figure out, who am I gonna play Dungeons and Dragons with? Like, who would be interested? I don't have any friends who play D&D already, so how do I get them to play with me? Well, generally, that means you're gonna probably wanna start out as the Dungeon Master. What you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to figure out your story, what your setting is, what the goals are. Maybe it's some dragon in a castle needs slaying. You need to decide that first because when you tell your friends, hey, you want to play D&D, you need to be prepared when they all come over to your house and play D&D with you. First thing you want to take a look at here is picking up the actual Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook. This is the first book that you need because it goes through everything from creating your character, how to interact with the world, movement, combat, magic. Basically, this is the essentials here. Everything you really need to know how to play. There's the Dungeon Master's Guide. This is really good if you, uh, if you want inspiration for world building and just kind of you know, crafting a story in the universe. It has lots of nice little details that you can help throw in there. And at the very end here, if you are really into monsters, always gotta check out the Monster Manual. Inside here is all the game stats for dragons and beasts of every sort, so it can be really good inspiration as well for you know, cool monsters you wanna put into a campaign. Along with your literature, there is another very important tool. It is the Dungeon Master screen, the DM screen. Now, this can be anything from something you create by yourself to this super cool one that the official D&D guys make. Basically, the DM screen is something that protects all your secret information from the players. So once you have this down, you can have a secret place to write special notes, throw dices uh, that no one can see the rolls of, and uh, basically work behind the scenes with your players right in front of you. Now, onto the table. Um, in front of me, I got a lot of stuff here. There is a lot of gear, and some of it's old, some of it's new. As I said earlier, you kind of start collecting this over the years, and eventually you get to a point where you have a little bit of everything. You got some buildings, some trees, and stuff like that. So I'm actually gonna kind of uh, start off here with the, the basics and the essentials of stuff to have on the table here. Basically, you'll want a grid. Uh, you see before you, we have this big one here. I actually just made this myself in Photoshop. Um, but you can also get grids like this. ChessX makes uh, a playable dry erase mat here. This can be a little cheaper of an alternative. If you are into something a little more fancy, I would definitely consider just opening Photoshop up, taking some cool grass patterns and maybe uh, lining it like a one inch grid over it. Because you can go to your own local print shop and have them print a big sheet like this out for you. And, you can have it customized to whatever you want. You can have it laminated, you can use uh, markers on it. There's a lot of options if you want to just start out on a budget. You know, if you're making uh, your own, it can be somewhere around maybe $50 or so, but just getting uh, one of these from ChessX, these are about 20 bucks. So um, depending on what your budget is, you know, you can uh, choose your own mat. Rather than cool miniatures and figurines like this, it's very common for people to use paper cutouts Instead of them, uh, instead of actual plastic figurines, because they are a little cheaper, uh, it's a little easier to make more of them. But if you are into the actual figurines themselves, um, there's a lot of really great pre-painted and non-pre-painted figurines out there. The ones that we've primarily used in this uh, campaign are the ones that are made by Wiz Kids. They're the official Dungeons and Dragons uh, miniatures, and uh, you can get them pretty much everywhere: Amazon stores, so on and so forth. Uh, they look really cool, they come pre-painted, they're just really fun to use. So that's generally what I've been primarily using there. I'm going to talk about miniatures a little bit more because they play a very large role in the game. Not only are they uh, the pieces that represent your characters, players, animals, monsters, beasts, etc., they can also be incredible sources of inspiration for your game. Sometimes you have a whole game planned out and you're not really sure what to do at a certain section. But, you know, if you look through what's at your disposal, you start seeing, oh, well, what if this guy was in there? What if this giant ogre was in there? And sometimes when you buy these miniatures, they come in randomized packs. So you don't know what you're gonna get. And you pop one open, and suddenly, boom, you have, you have this creature or a person that you've never seen before, and you realize, wait a second, 
This would be really cool if the players could encounter this in the game. The best miniatures are the ones that you can use in any situation. Um, like, I can't get enough townsfolk. I didn't, not because I like townsfolk, but <laughs> it's great to have lots of peasants in your game. It brings worlds to life when you can just have, you know, characters that are generic you can project personalities onto. As much as this cool skeleton dude is, uh, he will only forever be a skeleton dude. He will never be anything else but a skeleton dude. However, on the other side, who knows what this guy is? He's a little guy with a little bag and a little robe. He could be anyone. He could be a sick assassin. He could be uh, your mom. I don't even know if it's a man or a woman. But th that's why it's so good, is because this can be used in any single situation. Also, these are dirt cheap. No one wants these. Because of how lame they look, uh, they make your players feel really cool, because when, uh, when your wizard or your druid comes up with a sick staff and meets this guy with a dumb little hat, you realize, wait a second, I am an amazing adventurer and you are just a peasant. There's a whole wide variety of ways to do buildings if you are interested. Going back to the early days here, before I even had terrain, um, the best way is to just get a laminated piece here and use a dry erase marker to draw the buildings. There's no actual walls, but um, sometimes that's just the, the fastest, best way to start out. Uh, outlines will uh, get you pretty far. Um, if you want to take a step up from there, there's a couple people who make these little clickable walls that you can just lay down. And those are really, uh, really handy. They're really versatile. But uh, if you want to really upgrade, uh, we also have been using these Dwarven Forge miniature terrain pieces lately. And they're modular, they come in just tiny little sections like this, and you can pretty much design any type of building you want with them. So these are definitely not the cheapest, unfortunately, but do they look the best? And are they the most uh, usable? Definitely. It's, uh, if, you, if you're looking for things like trees or other stuff in the background, Generally, you'll want to look at the, the area of like other miniatures, such as like model train sets or the people who make those little World War II decoration terrain diorama things. Um, these trees are just made by uh, like Bachman trees. You can get these on Amazon. They're actually made for model train sets, but in the D&D universe, they are absolutely perfect. The, uh, in the back here, we also have a couple other sets here that are made by like Pegasus Hobbies. If you want something that is, uh, these are actually really inexpensive pieces here that uh, are very large and they're really great for um, decorating uh, your game sets with. So they, uh, they make everything from these ruins to fences to streams and cobblestone paths and things like that. The biggest thing you'll want to consider when uh, starting out here, you want to start with versatility. The versatility applies to everything from the miniatures to, as I was showing earlier, the small uh, buildings and like clickable walls and stuff like that. Because they're a little more nondescript, they could be anything. They could be a crypt, they could be a house, they could be a church. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, D&D is all about using your imagination to run this game. And uh, you'll want pieces that don't lock you in too far to a, a certain location. The most important part is the essentials. What are the essentials? It is your player's handbook, it's your grid. It is something to represent your players, whether they're miniatures or paper cutouts, and obviously a set of dice. But once you realize you do like D&D and you've gotten your friends into it, it's definitely worth investing in these because they bring your world to life, they bring the story to life. Before going out and getting all this gear though and getting your stuff ready, uh, planning a good campaign is the core to having fun with any of this stuff. Having a cool castle wall or a cool dragon is pretty much useless if you don't have a good story to go with it. So generally the best stories I find are ones that involve a lot of interaction between players. Opportunities where they get to make choices, pick things out for themselves and go into uh, environments and situations where I'm not necessarily fully controlling everything. As a dungeon master, you're not trying to write a script for a story here. You're just trying to set a scene that allows these players to get involved and make their own decisions. As a DM, you're almost trying to offload as much work as possible to the players to have fun with it. And uh, hopefully you guys find this useful and uh, get some uh, games going of your own. If you do that, feel free to send us some pictures. We'd love to see your setups. Both take 24 points of damage as the oh, acid just, damn. just sprays and just slides across the ground, just like spilling out. And with that, he, he starts. Dude, you can gun caught at this so hard. Just like. <laughs> and miss all your targets, just like in real life. We need to get Christian Bale in here. Yeah, call him. Dude, up. I'll call